But greetings everybody and welcome back to the channel. I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are and uh, we are back with another story, although this time slightly different. Uh, Selwyn has, um, we both kind of talked about wanting to do um, sort of like crime reporting, crime stories, but based on true crime. So in this instance, we have a, um, a serial killer from America. Um, I've just read literally three lines and I'm like, what is what's wrong with these people? You know, it's the eternal question, I guess. What on earth is going on? Um, but anyway, uh, Selwyn has written a script, a story. Um, it is based on the, uh, an American serial killer called Carol Edward Cole, uh, from, uh, in the forties to the eighties, I believe he was killing for, but we'll get into it a little bit more, obviously. Um, and he's, he's confessed, I'm just reading, yeah, confessed to a total of 35 murders. Um, wow. I never heard of him before. Um, look, I know, I don't know a hell of a lot about serial killers. I do watch a lot of documentaries. Obviously, the more top profile, high profile, whatever, you know, like your Bundys, Gacy's, BTK, Dahmer, you know, um, does, does Manson fit in that group he's, he wasn't you technically didn't kill anybody himself is it, i mean that's a cult leader so is he, he's not really a serial killer i don't think but the way that this is going to work is um it is a cold read as it was before for uh, fisher of men um episode one um i have not read anything about this i do not know anything about this and as you and <laughs> forget the way i look right it is freezing cold so it's winter here in south africa particularly here on the coast so uh, i'm dressed to the nines anyway um it's a cold read i have i don't know i've never heard this guy before carol edward cole never i call i was calling him carol andrew cole for some reason but it's carol edward cole um and I, I know nothing about him. I didn't realize, I mean, obviously there's tons of serial killers everywhere. I don't pretend to know everybody. That would just be an impossibility. But the way it's going to work, I'm going to read I'm going to interject with my own thoughts. I'm going to say what I think, um, give my extremely humble opinion, because I'm not uh, a learned person on a serial killers. I don't pretend to be. But um, it's just me reading the script and the story that has uh that Selwyn um Beck has written, aka Silver Shadow, and you can go and ask him questions on our Discord, um, everywhere else. Um he's usually in chat here on uh YouTube and so on. And um so he's written the story. Um it was a little idea of mine. Um it's like let's do some serial killer stuff and and um we like sort of like went backwards and forwards between each other. And, and I've never met him. I don't know him from a bar of soap, um, Selwyn. And, um, but, uh, we seem to have this little thing going on now, which, which is working for now. And it's, it's awesome. He's a great writer. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading the story. Um, the, I, I just need to uh, reiterate to everybody out there that is listening back to this or watching this, or whatever, this image in the background that you see here, it doesn't pertain to anything to this case, it's just an image there for purposes of making everybody feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, it's a serial killer, how much more uncomfortable can you get? I don't know, you know what's wrong with these people? Anyway, that's this is how it's going to, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to give my opinion, and whatever else. Um, I just need to, uh, as I was saying, just let everybody know that uh, some of the names have been changed um, to protect uh, the, some of the victims, uh, families, and things like that. So, and there is um, some fictional stuff thrown into it uh, just to pad it out a little bit. So for legal purposes, I have to say that um, so that there's no comebacks and everything like that. Um, so anybody that for some reason um reads this or watches this um as we go through it um who is related to any of the family members um our thoughts are with you um what an absolute terrible thing to have gone through and um if we have 
in any shape or form uh, offended or hurt or um, got an, a information wrong, please do let us know in, in the comments below. Uh, we'd love to engage with you and obviously extend our sincere apologies if we have caused any issues or anything like that um, to you. It's a terrible thing that has um, happened um, to the to these people, the victims. And obviously the families they're after because, you know, they've got to live through this. It it never ends. It's a never-ending story. Not of the 80s movie kind either where it's nice and fluffy and flying through the air. Boy, only kids born in the 70s would understand that. Anyway, okay. As you see, this is The Dark Sent by Selwyn Beck and narrated by me, yours truly, Trev. Right, look at that fella. Hmm. Looks like your neighbor next door, isn't it? Anyway, here we go. Carol Edward Cole, May 9th, 1938 to December 6th, 1985, was an American serial killer who was executed in 1985 for killing at least 15 women and one boy by strangulation between 1947 and 1980. That is a really long time to get away with it. A really long time. And he confessed to a total of 35 murders. Right. Let's get into it. Wow. 35 murders. Okay. Anyway, prologue. Shadows of the past. In the quietude of the later years, where the remnants of sanity intermingled with the depths of depravity, a man named Cole found himself trapped within the merciless embrace of mental hospitals. The corridors echoed with tormented cries of lost souls, and each passing day unveiled another layer of darkness that lurked within his troubled mind. Cole's journey through these desolate institutions stretched across three long years, leaving behind a trail of shattered hopes and shattered lives. It was at the infamous Stockton State Hospital, the final stop on his tumultuous odyssey, that a chilling entry in Dr. Weiss's notes left a haunting imprint. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Dr. Weiss or Dr. Weiss? Anyway, uh, the notes left a haunting imprint. He seems to be afraid of the female figure and cannot have intercourse with her first, but must kill her before he can do it. Oh. Uh, Bunny did this, didn't he? He he killed. He didn't have a problem with intimacy. I don't think. I don't recall. But he killed people, and then um, what do they call that? What do they call it when they? Um, oh, come on, Trev, think. Oh my word! Anyway, uh, it's on. You know, it's when it's on the tip of your tongue. It's on the tip of my tongue. Wow. Anyway, okay. So they say, so, oh, it's so sick. What is wrong with people? Okay. The depths of Coles' disturbed psyche began to unravel, painting a heroine portrait of his troubled existence. In spite of being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, an enigmatic decision by Dr. Weiss led to Coles' release in April 1963. Wait, what? He was, oh, I mean, different times, okay, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Ne necromance? Is it necromance? Oh, come on. Ah, oh, necromance. Necromancer? Is that, is that what it is? Anyway, whatever. I'll forget. It'll probably come back to me at the end of the story. Um, so he was released in 1963. Oh, good. Yeah, you know, great. Seeking solace and a semblance of normalcy, he made his way to Dallas, Texas, where his brother Richard resided. Little did they know that this reunion would lay the groundwork for Coles' descent into madness and an unspeakable and unspeakable acts of horror. Yeah, I'm not surprised. With that, personality disorder... Antisocial personality disorder, not just personality, antisocial. Okay. Within the depths of Dallas, fate twisted its sinister fingers, entwining Coles' path with that of an alcoholic stripper named Billy Whitworth. 
In a haze of desperation and warped desire, they married, their union forming a volatile tinderbox of broken dreams and shattered illusions. This is not good, man. You've got somebody who has got this personality, antisocial personality disorder, and then you've got an alcoholic woman. Stripper, okay? And I, I mean nothing by, you know, you can strip all you want as far as I'm concerned, you know, whatever. But it's just that combination together is it really is, is not good. It, it is volatile. I mean, this is, this is really good writing by Selwyn. I mean, in a haze of desperation, warped desire, they're married. The union form in a volatile tinderbox of broken dreams. That is beautiful. You go, Selwyn. I think we're on the same page. I, I think I'm on the same page with Selwyn, yeah, thinking about this. But the darkness within Coles' soul remained unyielding, unaffected by the bonds of matrimony. Two years into the tumultuous union, tragedy struck as Cole, consumed by his own paranoia, convinced himself that Whitworth engaged in illicit affairs with men at a local motel. In his delusion, he set the motel ablaze, an inferno fueled by jealousy and a twisted desire for control. Holy crap. The flames devoured the building, leaving nothing but charred remnants of their shattered lives. Cole's arsonist act led to his arrest and subsequent imprisonment. Okay, good. Good police work, leaving behind a trail of scorched memories. So what happened to him there then? The passage of time proved no antidote to the festering darkness within Cole's soul. Upon his release from prison, he found himself consumed once more by the irresistible urge to snuff out life. I just saw what's coming up. I just read ahead. An 11-year-old girl in Missouri became his prey, her innocence a mere obstacle to his insatiable bloodlust. In the small town of Willow Creek, Missouri, nestled amidst serene forests and rolling hills, a sinister presence lurked in the shadows. Unbeknownst to the townsfolk, a notorious serial killer had set his sights on their peaceful community. The dark cloud of fear grew heavier with each passing day. You see, when it comes to kids, man, that's a no-no. Just death, just killing is a no-no. So why was he released then? So I guess they only got him on arson. Did she die in that in that fire? His wife? Must have. So why was he released then? If he was, if he was prisoned, he must have been found guilty. So why was he released I know it's easy for us in hindsight to say, like, you know, look back at it and go, why, why, why? But the fact of the matter is, is that he killed somebody at different times. And, and you know, the law's always been the law, hasn't it? Has it changed that much? Wow. That's terrible. One fateful evening, as the sun painted the sky in hues of gold and crimson, an 11-year-old girl named Lily was engrossed in her own innocent world. She possessed an indomitable spirit. Did I say that right? Wow, these are big words, Selwyn. Jeepers. Okay, she possessed an indomitable spirit, radiating an aura of curiosity. Oh, my God, I can't speak. Come on, Trev, you can do this. She possessed an indomitable spirit, radiating an aura of curiosity and resilience that even the darkest corners of evil couldn't extinguish. As the predator's twisted desires led him to target Lily, she found herself unwittingly caught in his web of malevolence. The predator's initial attempt at strangulation left Lily gasping for breath, a small frame overwhelmed by the intensity of the attack. However, fate had other plans for her. In the midst of the struggle, a ray of hope pierced through the darkness. Lily's instincts kicked into overdrive, and with every ounce of strength she could muster, she fought back. Desperate to escape the clutches of her tormentor, she clawed at his face. Go, Lily! Come on, you can do this! Striking him with a surprising ferocity, her screams echoed through the night, reaching the ears of a vigilant neighbor. Of, of a vigilant neighbor. Oh, good girl! Oh, please tell me she survives. She doesn't, does she? Mrs. Jenkins, an elderly woman with a heart of gold, had always felt a special bond with Lily. 
Sensing something was amiss, she rushed towards the commotion, her determination unwavering. Go, Mrs. Jenkins, come on, save her. With the predator momentarily stunned by Lily's tenacity, Mrs. Jenkins seized the opportunity. She bravely intervened, wielding a cast-iron skillet with all her might, delivering a swift blow to the assailant's head. The predator crumbled to the ground, his consciousness fading away. You go, Mrs. Jenkins! Yes, what a champion! Oh my! Is Lil- did Lily survive? The police arrived on the scene soon after, alerted by the flurry of activity in the quiet neighborhood. They apprehended the pret. They got him? Whose reign of terror had finally come to an end. As a handcuff secured his wrists, the weight of justice descended upon him. Lily survived. Mrs. Jenkins, what an absolute gem. Lily, bruised and shaken, found solace in the arms of her community. They rallied around her, offering support, love, and a renewed sense of security. The town stood united, vowing to protect the children from any future harm. In the aftermath of the harrowing night, of that harrowing night, Lily blossomed onto an even stronger young girl. The scars on her body served as a testament to her courage and resilience. With the support of her loved ones and the unwavering strength within her, she embarked on a journey of healing, determined to reclaim her innocence and live a life filled with love and joy. Yay, Lily! She did good. Mrs. Jenkins, though, wow. She's, you know, there's not many people that would do that, eh? Particularly nowadays, I guess maybe back then, you know, you didn't, I mean, serial killer probably wasn't even a term that was used then. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Her survival became an inspiration, a story of triumph over evil, echoing far beyond the confines of Willow Creek. Lilla's indomitable spirit, along with the swift action of Mrs. Jenkins and the unwavering support of the community, served as a reminder that even in the face of darkness, there is always a glimmer of hope, a light that refuses to be extinguished. Hmm. That is, wow, what a feel. And this is just the prologue? His failed attempt at strangulation marked yet another sinister chapter in his sordid tale. Arrested and sentenced to five, five years. For attempted murder. Okay, I don't know what the law is in America, particularly Willow Creek, Missouri. Is that normal? Any legal boffs out there that can like confirm that or let us know? Just drop a comment. Let us know, man. Five years. Arrested and sentenced to five years behind bars, he yearned for the day when his murderous fantasies would be unleashed once more. Where are the psychiatrists in this? I mean, if somebody's been caught literally red-handed um, sh- in the midst of strangulation of an 11-year-old, I mean, five years. You would have thought that there'd be some sort of process for a psychiatry test and psychiatry test or whatever. I don't know. After serving his time, the echoes of Cole's footsteps led him to the vast expanse of Nevada, where he unleashed his twisted desires once again. The victims piled up, suffocated by his relentless grip, their lives forever extinguished. Seeking respite from his own demons, he he willingly checked himself into a mental hospital, hoping for salvation from the darkness that consumed him. He checked himself in, so he he wasn't all gone. There was still some glimmer of good in him. I mean, he clearly he knew. I mean, he willingly checked himself into a hospital, so he knew that he had messed up and that he wasn't right, so he had to do what he had to do. The doctors, despite acknowledging the sinister nature of his thoughts, made the faithful to release him. Why? This is an utter failure 
by the people that we should be able to trust the most. Okay, I know mental hospitals have their own sort of like, I wouldn't say law, but they, you know, decision-making processes, I guess. Again, hindsight, six, you know, this is, when was this? This is the 60s, wasn't it, or whatever? The doctors, despite acknowledging the sinister nature of his thoughts, made the fateful decision to release him, unaware of the horrors that lay in wait. Oh, boy. As Cole boarded the ticket back to San Diego, oh, no, he's back to San Diego, the curtains lifted on a new chapter of terror, where the line between predator and prey blurred, and the streets became hunting grounds for a remorseless killer. That was it. I mean, he's he's been given the freedom to carry out every single whim that he wants now. The city's unsuspecting inhabitants would soon discover that a malevolent force hidden beneath a veneer of normalcy lurked in their midst, ready to claim their lives as mere stepping stones on his path of destruction. Boy, they got this so wrong. Hindsight, Trev, hindsight, hindsight. Okay. And so the stage was set, and the curtains of darkness drew back. From the depths of Coles's tortured soul, a symphony of fear and suffering was about to unfold, leaving an indelible mark on the annals. <laughs> on the annals of horror. Not on the annals. <laughs> There's two ends, Trev. There's not one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'm such a loser. <laughs> On the annals of horror. I shouldn't be laughing. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a complete and utter failure by the system, isn't it? And and it's, you know, the thing is, it's a story that is kind of repeated over history, isn't it? It, it happens all too often. Um, maybe not so much anymore, but it still happens. I mean, you hear stories and you read stories and fact-driven stories that these things do happen still. Um, what are the stats? What are the stats of serial killers per square mile, I guess, or per kilometer or whatever? I wonder what, I wonder what it is. Like, every neighborhood's probably got, like, two or three serial killers or something stupid like that or something. I did see a stat, like, ages ago about something like that. But anyway, what a great prologue, man. That is that is really set it up wonderfully. And again, just to reiterate that the name Lily is not real. It's, it's a fictional uh, name to protect the real Lily. And uh, Miss Jenkins, Mrs. Jenkins is also not the real name. So it's, um, those are fictitious, um, uh, to protect those people, the identity of those people and, and to not, you know, family and, and descendants and so on. Um, okay. Here we go. The Dark Descent by Selwyn Beck. During the later years of Coles' life, he found himself trapped within the walls of various mental hospitals. Driven by an intense fear of the female figure, he believed he had to kill before he could engage in intimacy. Despite being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, Cole was released in April 1963 from Stockton State Hospital, seeking solace in the company of his brother Richard in Dallas, Texas. Cole's twisted perspective towards women remained unchanged. It wasn't long before Cole met Billy Whitworth, an alcoholic stripper whom he married. However, their relationship faltered due to his deep-seated paranoia. Convinced of Whitworth's infidelity, Cole set a motel ablaze, leading to his arrest for arson. After serving his time, Cole's dark impulses resurfaced, leading him to attempt to strangle an 11-year-old girl in Missouri. He was apprehended and sentenced to five years in prison. God, I'm so, I was so happy that Lily like, got out of that. And Miss Jenkins, what a hero. Wow, to have the balls to do that to somebody, to a murderer? I mean, that, that, that is some serious courage. Kudos to her, man. 
I hope she got recognized for that. I really do. Heroes are too far and few between, unfortunately, in this world. Why does it feel like it's so much easier to do bad than it is to do good? I don't know, man. It's weird. Upon his release, Cole's insidious nature led him to Nevada, where he once again attempted to strangle two women. Seeking help, he voluntarily checked himself into a mental hospital. Oh, so he tried to strangle two more people, two, two more women. I mean, th- that's the thing, though. He checked himself in. So, I mean, he knew, you know, he was clear of mind, you know, sane to a, a point to check himself in. So there was hope, you know, there was that little, that, that little bit of goodness in him that said, you know, this ain't right, dude, get, get yourself sorted, man. And, and the system let him down and, and led the, uh, the people of America down. Again, like I said, all too familiar. Seeking help, he voluntarily checked himself into a mental hospital. While the doctors noted his murderous fantasies, they made the fateful decision not to detain him. And he was given a ticket back to San Diego. Oh, he, they gave him a ticket back to San Diego. That's unbelievable. To first just, I mean, you can't do that today. You may, you imagine walking into a mental hospital and going, um, I've tried to kill two people. I need to be hospitalized. You wouldn't go to a mental hospital. You would actually go to um, prison immediately. Wouldn't it? Isn't that how it works? Again, if you know, let me know. Because America is different with, with the law, isn't it? That, uh, you know, we know the law, the law, whatever. But the, the laws in America are, are very, very different um, in each state, I think. The people in America, please help me out here. Yeah, because I, I don't know. I know that there are some crazy laws in each state. and <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm not going to say what I think some of the laws are because then I could be horribly wrong. Like you can't drink water after midnight or something. <laughs> Turn into a gremlin. <laughs> what else? Where's my mind at? Okay. Anyway, back to back to this wonderful script. Go sell one. Good job, man. In the depths of Coles' twisted psyche, a mixture of frustration, compulsion, and a perverse sense of entitlement fueled his actions. You see, but that's the thing, though. Selwyn's got this spot on. Entitlement. They've literally given him the freedom to go out and commit that murder. Haven't they? I mean, they've given him a fucking ticket and said, yeah, go. Go kill. Freedom. He has your freedom of the city. Go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, where we're sending you to, San Diego. That's where you're going to do murderous things. As he voluntarily checked himself into the mental hospital, a part of him likely sought relief from the tumultuous desires that plagued his mind. Selwyn and I are so on the same page here. But deep down, he knew that his fantasies of violence and murder were an integral part of his being, irreversibly intertwined with his sense of control and power. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Selwyn, you gem, you've got the spot on, man. While the doctors recognize his murderous inclinations, their decision not to detain him likely stirred a surge of elation within Cole. Exactly. Entitlement. God damn. Selwyn, you've got this absolutely spot on. For, for Cole, it's all about the, the control and the power, right? Over, the, over women. And the way that they've released him and said to him, go, it's like that's impo- that they've empowered him to carry out those fantasies, to go and kill. <sighs> oh, okay. In his distorted perception, the escape from confinement validated his superiority and cunning. Perhaps he believed that he had successfully manipulated the system once again. And he's actually not the first time proving that he was too elusive, too intelligent to be caught and held accountable for his dark desires. Receiving a ticket back to San Diego may have further solidified his twisted sense of invincibility. There you go. That's it. It was as if the world had presented him with an opportunity to continue his heinous acts 
unencumbered by the restraints of institutionalization. Wow, what a word. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Institutionalization. Wow. Those big words, man. For, for a, a person that didn't even finish school. That's that big brain. Cole's mind, I didn't finish school, by the way. Not Selwyn. Selwyn's a gem. I, he's the big brain. I'm the idiot. Okay. Cole's mind may have been consumed by a chilling blend of anticipation and sadistic satisfaction. Now that he was free to roam, to seek out new victims, and to, sa- and to satiate his insatiable hunger for control and destruction. It was in San Diego that Cole embarked on a chilling spree of serial murders. You see, that's, the institution has led... Oh, man. Let us down, man. Come on. His first adult victim was Essie L. Buckley, whom he encountered in a tavern. He mercilessly strangled her, carrying her lifeless body in the trunk of his car before disposing of it. Just two weeks later, he killed another woman, whose identity remained unknown, and buried her in a secluded wooded area. Cole's twisted rationale justified these acts by associating the victims with his adulterous mother. Oh boy, here we go. Yeah, we go. Oy, 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 oy. Oh boy. Why is it always, oh, oh no, it's not always the mother, but why is it the mother? Why? What is it? What is it in the psyche that is is driven these serial killers to look at like, what is it with the mother figure, man? In the sultry summer of July 1973, fate wove its intricate tapestry, intertwined the lives of two souls in an unexpected union. Cole, a charming and charismatic gentleman, crossed paths with Diana Faye Younglove Paschal, a resilient barmaid with a captivating spirit and a turbulent past. It was a balmy evening when Cole strolled into the dimly lit tavern, seeking respite from the sweltering heat. The tinkling glasses and lively conversations filled the air as he took a seat at the worn wooden bar. Amidst the bustling atmosphere, his eyes were drawn to a woman with a magnetic presence behind the counter, Diana. Diana, her raven black hair cascading gentle waves and her eyes brimming with a hint of mystery, met Colza's gaze. There was an unspoken connection, a recognition of shared struggles and hidden strength. Their souls danced to an unfamiliar melody, as if destiny had orchestrated their meeting. Oh, this doesn't sound like it's going to end good. Obviously it doesn't. Over time, Cole became a familiar face at the tavern, drawn to the genuine warmth and authenticity that radiated from Diana. As their interactions evolved from casual exchanges to heartfelt conversations, they discovered kindred spirits within one another. At this point, I wonder how many he had killed. You know, it's over time that he's met up with Diana. I wonder how many he killed from the moment he walked in to, to this point now, how many other women he has killed. He's like setting her up, isn't he? In the quiet moments stolen between servant patrons and pouring drinks, Cole and Diana shared their triumphs and tribulations. The wounds of the past became the common ground that bound them, each understanding the battle the other had fought against their personal demons. Their shared experiences created a unique bond as they became pillars of strength for one another. Through heartfelt conversations and stolen glances, love blossomed amidst the clinking of glasses and laughter-filled nights. Diana, once consumed by the grip of alcoholism, found solace in Coles' unwavering support and understanding. His love became her guiding light, igniting a flame of hope that had long been extinguished. I said, oh man, he's so setting her up. I hope she survives. Bloody hell. Their courtship was a delicate dance of trust and vulnerability. Cole gently encouraged Diana's healing journey, standing by her side through every stumble and setback, with patience and unwavering devotion. He helped her discover her own strength, reminding her that her past did not define her future. 
As the seasons changed and time spun its eternal tapestry, Cole and Diana found themselves standing at the precipice of a new chapter. In a small intimate ceremony filled with love and close friends, they exchanged vows, promising to cherish and support one another through life's joys and challenges. Their unions became a testament to the transformative power of love, proving that even amidst battles with personal demons, redemption and happiness could be found. Cole and Diana embarked on a journey, hand in hand, sharing a love that had weathered storms and emerged stronger on the other side. Together, they created a haven of love and understanding, a sanctuary where past pains were healed and new beginnings bloomed. The love between Cole and Diana became an inspiration to others, a reminder that even in the darkest moments, love can conquer all and rewrite the narratives of our lives. But their tumultuous relationship was fraught with arguments and fights, leading Cole to frequently disappear for days at a time. Oh, it's going to happen. I just, I, oh. In the tumultuous union between Cole and Diana, Faye, young love, Pashel, a toxic dynamic of dysfunction and violence unfolded. Both individuals struggled with their own personal demons, with Pashal battling against her own addiction to alcohol. The marriage became a breeding ground for explosive arguments and intense fights, fueled by the volatile combination of their inner demons. It's going to happen. It's gonna, it's, he's going to get you know, like go over the edge, you know? Just get pushed and, and that's gonna, he's going to snap. For Cole, the relationship may have offered a twisted sense of control and power. As the arguments escalated and tensions mounted, he found himself succumbing to the dark recesses of his psyche. The periods when he would disappear for days at a time became opportunities for him to fulfill his insidious desires. During these absences, he committed further murders, some of which involved disturbing acts of cannibalism. Cole embarked on a sinister path, committing further acts of murder. His victims fell prey to his sadistic tendencies, and in some cases, the crimes took on a chilling dimension with disturbing acts of cannibalism. It's not as in killing, he's eaten. Oh man, this dude is evil. Wow, so he went, he went that route. So not only does he have intimate relations with the corpses i'm still trying to figure out what that name is um he is also now eating them how did he do it did he cook them like a dahmer or did he just eat raw meat oh oh uh, these depraved actions may have provided Cole with a perverse sense of dominance and gratification as he indulged in the, his most primal urges while evading the consequences of his actions. Oh man, it just, just doesn't, it, it really just doesn't sit well. The violence within the marriage likely escalated over time, with the battles between Cole and Pashal intensifying. The constant turmoil and internal strife combined with the underlying darkness that fueled Coles' actions culminated in a tragic event. Oh, here we go. In September 1979, Coles' murderous impulses overwhelmed him, leading him to strangle Pashel to death. Despite a neighbor's suspicions and the discovery of Pashel's body hidden in a closet, the police attributed her death to alcohol abuse and released Cole without charge. This is 1979. What the fuck are the police doing? Seriously, what are the police doing that they couldn't understand the differences between strangulation and um, alcohol? Uh, How? If he strangled her, which he did, he strangled her to death. Okay, the body okay, strangle, right? It's not going to strangle on a flipping arms. It's going to strangle on a neck, right? Where are the marks on the neck? Okay, we're talking. This is San Diego, right? 
police, really? Really? Again, how many people have been murdered since release from the mental hospital? You know, it just, failure after failure after failure by the law enforcement, mental enforcement, whatever. Damn it. When Mrs. Jenkins caught, you know, he should have been put away for life after trying to take Lily's life. He, then and there, that is an... Mm. Leaving San Diego, Cole... Oh, so he left. Okay, so this is what he does. So he goes to a place, commits murder, gets caught, gets released early, leaves. Okay, so they send him back to San Diego, does his thing there, gets released, goes to another area, and... Oh. Leaving San Diego, Cole continued his nomadic lifestyle. In 1979, he encountered Mary Cushman at a bar in Las Vegas. Their encounter led to a motel where they engaged in a night of passion before Cole ruthlessly strangled her to death. So, and I thought he couldn't um, engage in um, any form of intimacy. Well, mind you, a night of passion really isn't intimate, is it? It's more just like, bam, bam, thank you, ma'am. You know, I guess you know, with a stranger at least, you know, with your wife or girlfriend that you've known for some time, it is, it can still be passion, obviously, but, so he, he strangled her to death? On the night, often, it, it doesn't matter. Fucking, what's wrong with this guy? Oh, God, he returns to Dallas. Oh, come on, man. Returning to Dallas, Cole found himself trapped in the clutches of his own sinister desires once again. November 1980 became a haunting chapter in his dark tale as he mercilessly claimed the lives of three innocent women, leaving a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. This is 1980, man. This is... Um, when was Bundy? Bundy was around about this time, wasn't he? Dahmer as well. Wasn't Dahmer... Uh, Dahmer was 80s, wasn't he? No, Dahmer went, went for quite a while, didn't he? I mean, this is the height of serial killers, isn't it? In the 80s. 70s and 80s. I think. Three women. Damn. As Cole's dark journey unfolded, he not only left behind a trail of victims, but also left a lasting impact on the communities he encountered. Yeah, no doubt. The fear and uncertainty he instilled in those around him permeated the cities and towns where he struck, leave an indelible mark on the collective consciousness. Yeah, it would. Jeez. News of the serial killing spread, creating an atmosphere of heightened vigilance and caution. People locked their doors, walked the streets with trepidation, and shared whispered warnings about the dangerous individual who lurked among them. The local authorities worked tirelessly to apprehend the elusive killer, but Coles's cunning and ability to adapt continued to frustrate their efforts. You only caught him fucking twice. I mean, come on, police. Oy. Anyway. Communities rallied together, seeking solace in each other's presence and worked collaboratively. Whoa! Oh, tongue twister. Collaboratively to protect themselves and their loved ones. Neighborhood watch groups formed, local businesses implemented extra security measures, and the community as a whole became more aware of the importance of vigilance and looking out for one another. In the face of darkness, acts of resilience and unity emerged. Support groups for the victims' families provided solace and a platform for healing. Organizations dedicated to raising awareness about violence against women gained momentum, striving to prevent future tragedies and provide resources for those in needs. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's, I mean, it's the one good thing, obviously, um, if any good can come of it, that would be that, right? Support groups, um, the communities uh, sort of like banded together and, and stuff like that. Um, and any violence against anyone, not, not just women, but anyone, kids, women, men, whatever, 
Stop it. Just stop it. It's ridiculous. It's silly. Amidst the chaos and grief that enveloped the city. Enveloped? Enveloped. There we go. Wow, we. And I'm a homeschool teacher. Amidst the chaos and grief that enveloped the city, the authorities launched a relentless investigation to unmask the face of this elusive killer. The evidence began to point towards Cole, casting a shadow of suspicion over his name. In one of the killings, a witness recalled seeing a figure resembling him near the crime scene, further fueling the flames of doubt. Cole's twisted desires had become his own undoing. As, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a given, isn't it? They eventually slip up. Even more so now because DNA. I mean, you know, you, how long does DNA last for? Does it last for a lifetime? Does it, does it, is it like 20, 30 years? I mean, no matter what. If the police had done their work properly and collected evidence, DNA evidence at that, you know. Okay, again, hindsight's a wonderful thing. You think back, you know, the, the DNA wasn't even in existence then, obviously. Um, the networks to connect all the police stations and all the authorities and, you know, the FBI's and CIA's and, and all this sort of stuff. It's understandable that it's easy to slip through the net, obviously. Nowadays, not a chance, man. Um, it was at the scene of another chilling murder that fate finally caught up with him. Responding to a distress call, the police arrived to find Cole lingering amidst the aftermath, his twisted satisfaction visible in his cold, calculating eyes. Why do the killers always come back? Is it that wanting that gratification, that power, that whole empowering feel? Arrested and brought to justice, Cole stood trial for his heinous crimes, facing a society hungry for answers and seeking closure for the shattered lives he had left behind. The courtroom became a theater of justice as the prosecution meticulously presented the damning evidence against him, painting a portrait of a man consumed by his dark impulses. In the face of overwhelming evidence, Coles' defense team mounted a desperate fight attempting to cast doubt upon the validity of the prosecution's case. Yeah, I mean, I know they've got a job to do, um, but, I mean, come on, you know? Okay, so let's just go through that again. So, in the face of overwhelming evidence, Cole's defense team mounted a desperate fight, attempting to cast doubt upon the validity of the prosecution's case. They sought to paint a picture of a troubled soul driven to the edge, a victim of his own demons. But the weight of the evidence proved insurmountable, yeah, no doubt, leaving little room for escape from the clutches of the law. Finally, the gavel came down, pronouncing Cole guilty on multiple counts of murder. The courtroom erupted in a mix of relief and sorrow, a collective exhale after months of anguish. Justice had been served, but the scars left behind by his actions would forever mar the lives of the victims, families, and the community as a whole. As Cole was led away to face the consequences of his actions, a sense of closure washed over the city. The dark cloud that had loomed for so long began to dissipate, a line rays of hope to pierce through. Though the wounds would take time to heal, the community could now begin to rebuild, their resilience shining through the cracks of tragedy. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, the communities get hit so hard, and there's this level of trust in the system, in the in the law, in the police, in in you know. It's got to be rebuilt, and and that can't be hard. I mean, that can't be easy. It's got to be super, super hard. It's so unfortunate, man. That it shouldn't. It should never have gotten to this um, state. It really shouldn't have. Extradited to Nevada in February 1984. So this was, he was caught in when? 1980? I think so. 1980. So he spent four years in prison. So he was extradited to Nevada in February of 1984. Cole stood trial for the strangulation deaths of two women in 1977 and 1979. In October of that same year, he was sentenced to death. Okay. As fate was sealed... As his fate was sealed, Cold uttered a simple, thanks, judge. 
The American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, and other anti-death penalty campaigners sought to have his sentence commuted, but Cole himself protested. You see, that's it. That's the whole sanity thing. He knew. I mean, you know, he knew that he had done wrong. So, and as for these, you know, I don't know. Should the death penalty thing, should, should uh, what is, wherever you are in America, or the world for that matter, um, what is the state of the death penalty? Does it exist in your state? Um, do you support it? Are you against it? I I love um, chatting to people in 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 you know the comments below, and I do read them. So drop a comment and um, let me know how it is where you are. Um, you know, at what sort of level do you go? Well, you know, he was what thirteen murders or something like that, and you said he did thirty-two. Where do you stand on that then? You know. He's got to have the death penalty, surely? You think about prison and... and you, I mean, he probably wouldn't have lasted in prison, in, in gen pop, right? General population, because I, I know that anything with kids is a no-no. That is an absolute no-no. Uh, regardless of what kind of person you are, um, the the whole kids thing is a no no. So I reckon if he, uh, it doesn't say here, yeah, obviously, if you went to General Pop or, or whatever, but um, he would have been murdered, shanked, or whatever they call it. I don't know. Whatever. He would have been taken care of in all the wrong ways, I guess. But yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, the fact that he himself protested against, like, I want to die. Clearly, he wants to die, and he knows it. That must be such a weird feeling, knowing that you've done wrong, and you are um, you are going for the death penalty. That's such a juxtaposition. Is that what they call it? Opposite ends. It's like you want to kill, but you want to die. It is. It's so such a. It must be such a strange thing. Yeah. Finally, uh, on December 6th, 1985, Cole met his demise through lethal injection at Nevada State Prison. The chapter of darkness that had defined his later, later life came to an end, leaving behind a haunting legacy of violence and unimaginable cruelty. In the years that followed, the memories of Cole's sinister reign gradually faded into the annals of history. I've got to write this time. The victims were remembered not solely for their tragic endings, but for the vibrant lives they have lived and the light they had brought into the world. Their memory became a beacon of strength, reminding the community of the collective resilience in the face of darkness. And as time marched forward, the scars of the past served as a solemn reminder to remain vigilant, to cherish the fragility of life and to unite against the forces that sought to extinguish the light. The legacy of those lost would forever serve as a testament to the power of resilience and the unwavering spirit of those who refused to be defined by the darkness they had endured. The story of Cole and his reign of terror serves as a stark reminder of the capacity for both good and evil within humanity. It highlights the resilience and strength of communities in the face of adversity, and the ongoing need for vigilance and empathy and support to combat the darkness that can arise within society. Through the story, listeners are not only confronted with the chilling detail of Coles' crimes, but also prompted to reflect on the power of community, the importance of fostering a safe and inclusive society, and the ongoing pursuit of justice for the victims and the families. Absolutely spot on. You know, Selwyn has got that. Um, 150,000 quadruplian percent correct. You know, it's, like I said, it's, if there's any good to come out of it, is that, is that the communities have gotten closer, they're looking out for each other, there's groups that have been formed, you know, uh, violence against women, kids, men, whatever, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it's not just, 
women's lives that matters or kids' lives, that all lives matter. And that, and, and that is just my opinion. You may feel different. All lives matter, whether it be canine, feline, human, alien, whatever. All lives matter. That's uh, simple as that. Right. The end. And all right. Now, these are notes from Selwyn. Okay. Author's note number one. Please remember that this portrayal is speculative and functionalized, aiming to provide a psychological perspective based on the information given. The thoughts and motivations of real-life individuals can be complex and multifaceted, and it is not possible to fully ascertain their true inner workings. Absolutely correct. It's like I said at the very beginning, a lot of it, uh, not a lot of it, names, certain names like Lily and uh, Mrs. Jenkins and some of the others have been... um, change to protect the families and not um, put them in any sort of limelight or um, to people find out who they are. I mean, you know, we are not here about that. We are here just to not necessarily understand, but to read through what this moron did um, and the damage that he caused. So it's important to remember that... um, there are lives that were forever changed because of this, and we should remember those lives rather than this idiot's life. Okay. Some more notes from Selwyn. There are certain legal considerations to keep in mind, such as defamation, invasion of privacy, and rights of publicity. Absolutely. Defamation. If the portrayal of a real-life person in a story includes false statements that harm their reputation, it could potentially lead to defamation claims. It's important to ensure that the information presented is based on accurate facts or clearly labeled as fictionalized, hence why we are reading this part here. Invasion of privacy. Invasion of privacy claims may arise if the story reveals private or personal information about a real-life individual without their consent. This includes details about their personal life, medical history, or private conversations, which is why we do this kind of story like this. Uh, we don't do any um, heavy quotations um, because, you know, anything taken off the internet has to be taken with a mega, mega pinch of salt. And if you don't understand that, then you should not be on the internet. That's all I'm saying about that. Rights of publicity. The rights of publicity generally protect an individual's rights to control the commercial use of the names, likeness, or identity. Using a real-life character's name, likeness, or other identifiable features for commercial purposes without their permission may infringe upon these rights. Pictures of this dude is are available on Google. Um, you know, uh, that's where we got that picture from. So, uh, yeah, we, we obviously have not included any victims, uh, personal details, or um, interviews, uh, or any direct quotations from them whatsoever, because we respect their privacy. um, And we certainly don't want any sort of uh, claims or defamation character or anything like that whatsoever. General guidance. Using a story based on real life events or characters can potentially raise legal implications particularly if it involves sensitive or private information about real individuals. It's important to consider the rights of privacy and publicity, as well as potential defamation issues when utilizing real-life elements in a story. To minimize the legal risks, you could consider fictionalizing certain aspects of the story, altering names and making it clear that the story is a work of fiction. By creating fictional characters inspired by real-life events or individuals, you can add a layer of protection and distance yourself from from potential legal concerns. Absolutely. Which is why we change the names to uh, Lily and um, uh, Mrs. Jenkins. Uh, some of the locations have probably been altered too. However, to ensure compliance with applicable laws and regulations, it is strongly advised to consult with a qualified legal professional who can review the specifics of your situation and provide accurate guidance tailored to your needs. They will be able to offer advice on potential risk, intellectual property considerations, and any necessary steps to take to protect yourself legally. So this is a general guidance for everybody that's thinking about doing something like this. Um, Be prepared. um, You know, have lawyers on your side and um, for it to to help along with any sort of uh, issues that may arise. Again, like I said at the very beginning, names, places, and so on um, have been altered. 
we haven't taken any direct quotations or taken any notes from you know any specifics uh we've taken um, notes from we followed a very loosely um guided story about cole and his interactions and and, and i think the way that selwyn has written this um is just beautifully done <laughs> beautifully done beautifully done it's very well written very well drawn um a a visual picture in the mind uh, how he talks about the bar and and the um the hair of diana and and so it's just the way that he's is is dramatize it into your head is is absolutely fantastic i think he's done a spot on job However, please keep in mind that the story is based on real-life events, and if you plan to use it for commercial purposes or in public setting, it's important to consider the legal implications and potential rights of the individuals involved, which is the way we've done it, the way we've done it, and Selwyn has done that absolutely spot on. Um, and that was literally written by Selwyn back four days ago. On the 20th of May, he wrote that. Um, and there we go, guys. What an interesting, um, messed-up individual. My God. God. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anything more to add to that. Um, wonderfully scripted by Selwyn, and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, my iteration of it, my narration of it, and my little interjections. And that's what we plan to do. Um, Selwyn is busy with some more stuff, uh, whether it, it's going to be more um, based on true crime, real crime, serial killers, what murder stories, whatever. Um, and if you would like us to cover a story, um, whether it be old, new, current, whatever, um, please, uh, again, drop a comment below and let us know, and uh, we'll consider it, we'll take it into consideration, we'll have a chat uh, amongst ourselves and talk about uh, how we can go with it and how we can proceed with it. Um, yeah, I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to listen to this. Um, what a fun way of doing some stuff, something different. And um, and please forgive me for some of the mispronunciations and and so on. I'm I'm not a, a learned person by any stretch of the imagination, um, but uh, it's it's all just about uh, building a community here on YouTube and just having um, a conversation, and talking about these sort of things, and uh, it cannot be done without you guys. So uh, thank you for participating by listening and hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel. The more of you guys that do that, the more we know we are doing right and that uh, we can then continue. So I appreciate you guys so very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, reading another one for you again. Until then, be safe. Cheers, everybody.